Kia ora, Kiwi Kodja here and welcome to episode 71, Hongi's Journey to Death. This isn't part of the Whangaroa series, but it does follow on from episode 69. Now, we left that episode with Hongi Hika seriously wounded. And from Turner's account in episode 70, we have a musket ball smashing Hongi's right collarbone, then exiting from his back, below the shoulder blade and close to the spine. So let's have a look at this wound in a bit more detail. Here is a 3D male figure, the yellow rod, the path of the musket ball. As you see, it passes through a large portion of the right lung. The entry hole would have been small, the exit hole much larger. Now, when there's communication between the lung cavity and the outside air, when breathing in, Air comes in through the wound and into the pleural cavity that exists because the lung has collapsed. No air actually enters the right lung at all. The oxygenation of the blood drops and the body counters switching more blood to vital areas. Any exertion is exhausting. Let's look at the trajectory of the ball. There are two likely scenarios. The first is Hongi could have been standing upright and shot from above, someone in a tree perhaps. The second is being shot by someone at the same level, but he would have needed to be stooping over, the pose of someone keeping low while moving forward. The scenario of the tree doesn't sound convincing. If your enemy has muskets, then being up in a tree is a death sentence. The more likely scenario is Hongi being crouched over and moving forward. In the weeks after his wounding on the 10th of January 1827, Hongi makes the Ra Pa his home. Now, stories of Hongi's health coming out of Whangara vary with time. There are early reports that his wounds have closed and he may recover. The opinion of Europeans that see him, mainly missionaries, are split. However, what I want to do is jump forward to November 1827, 10 months after the wounding, when Hongi makes a visit to the Bay of Islands. There are two encounters that have been recorded. We'll deal with Augustus Earle's account first. Now, Earle is 34 and a travelling artist from London. He did this famous painting of the wounded Hongi. Let's hear from Earle. This man, Shangi Hongi, was a most extraordinary character and a person I had long had a great curiosity to see. A few days after my visit to the missionaries at Pai Hia, while we were busily employed in constructing our huts at Kororeraka, it's in the morning, assisted by about 50 natives, on a sudden a great commotion took place amongst them. Each left his work and ran to his hut and immediately returned armed with both musket and katush box. Apparently, all the arms in the village were musket and all seemed ready for immediate use. On inquiring into the cause of all these warlike preparations, I was informed that Chungi and his chief men were crossing the bay in several large war canoes. And though he was considered a friend and ally, yet, as he was a man of such desperate ambition and consummate cunning, it was considered necessary to receive him under arms which he might take either as a compliment or as a proof of how well they were aware of the guests they were receiving. He landed about a mile from the village, and we, that is Earl and Shand, his travel companion, lost no time in procuring an interpreter, with whom we went instantly to pay our respects to the celebrated conqueror. We found him and his party, his slaves preparing their morning repast. The scene altogether was highly interesting. In a beautiful bay surrounded by high rocks and overhanging trees. It's the southern portion of Tarpeka Beach. 
The chief sat in mute contemplation, the arms piled up in regular order on the beach. Shangi not only from his high rank, but in consequence of his wound being tabooed, or rendered holy, set apart from the rest. We approached the chief and paid our respects to him. He received us kindly and with a dignified composure as well accustomed to receive homage. His look was emaciated, but so mild was the expression of his features that he would have been the last man I should have imagined accustomed to the scenes of bloodshed and cruelty. But I soon remarked that when he became animated in conversation, his eyes sparkled with fire and their expressions changed, demonstrating that it only required his passions to be roused to exhibit him under a very different aspect. His wife, Tangi Fari, younger sister of Turi Katuku and daughter, Rongo, the late Turi Katuku being her mother, were permitted to sit close to him, to administer to his wants, no others being allowed so to do, on account of his taboo. He was arrayed in a new blanket, which completely enveloped his figure, leaving exposed his highly tattooed face, and head profusely covered with long, curly black hair, adorned with a quantity of white feathers. He was altogether a very fine study, and with his permission, I made a sketch of him. Whatever became of this? And also one including the whole group. Finding we were newcomers, he asked us a variety of questions, and among others, our opinion of his country. His remarks were judicious and sensible, and he seemed much pleased with our admiration of his territory. I produced a bottle of wine that I had brought with me, and his wife supplied him with a few glasses, which seemed to revive and animate him. We were then invited to join him in a trip in one of his canoes, in which was placed a bed for him to recline upon. His wife seated herself close to him, while his daughter, a very pretty, interesting girl, about 15 years of age, again Rongo, also called Harriata, she will marry Honey Hickey in 1835. Took a paddle in her hand, which she used with the greatest dexterity. I took the liberty of presenting her with a bracelet, with which she seemed highly delighted. When Shangi, perceiving that I was in a giving mood, pointed to his bed and asked me for a razor. Fortunately, I had put one in my pocket on setting out and now I presented it to him, by which gifts we continued on terms of great sociability and friendship. After a pleasant cruise with this to us extraordinary family and contriving to make ourselves pretty well understood, we returned about the close of day and landed at the bay. <laughs> I always wondered how this famous painting came into being, and there we are. Now, the next day, Hongi's party goes around to Kororareka, where Te Whare Umu welcomes him and celebrates him. It is all very emotional. Even Earl sheds tears. It's apparent to all that Hongi's time is running out. They stay the night and leave the next morning, but Earl's final comments here are interesting. All was streaming with tears and blood from cutting themselves with shells while Shangi and his friends embarked on their large and richly ornamented canoes and sailed from our beach, Kororareka. After his departure, I soon discovered that, notwithstanding their affection, King George, Whare Umu, and his friends were most happy their visitors had left them, and that it was more the dread of Shangi's power than love for him that induced them to treat him with such respect and homage. So, even near the end, when he was so weak and frail, he was still a force to be reckoned with. The second account is by Captain Peter Dillon, 39, an acquaintance of Hongi for the last 12 years. On the 13th of November, 1827, Hongi visits his ship off Kororareka. 
About 10 a.m. I was visited by Shongi. He arrived at the ship accompanied by his chiefs and family in two splendid war canoes. Though labouring under the effect of a wound that is fast sinking him to his grave, his frame being already reduced almost to a skeleton, his manner is still commanding. Ferocity and cunning twinkle in his piercing eyes, while his curling lip and short teeth proclaim him a genuine savage, but one in whom traits of intellect are manifested. His wound is singular, a bullet having passed through his lungs, whence a hole appears upon his chest and back, through which the latter, the wind issues with a noise resembling in some degree that from the safety valve of a steam engine. That's from the back wound, which, however, he himself makes a subject of merriment. Although he does not experience much pain, it is evident he cannot last long, and of this he seems fully aware. Just as he was about to leave, he pointed to his daughter, Rongo, an interesting girl about 13, actually 15, who was sitting upon the hammock rail with a cloth in her hand, staying the issue in her father's back. He whispered to me that he was anxious I should become his son-in-law as he had not long to live and wished to see her settle before his death, that when the other tribes heard he was no more, they would fall upon his offspring and friends in revenge for the many victories he'd obtained over them. Dylan politely declines the offer. At the end of February 1828, forays are built at Mahoi. The dying Hongi is carried there from Whare Ra Pa, and sometime in the first week of March, the great Hongi Hika dies. The final resting place of his bones unknown. Hongi was such a complex character. In peace, he was reliable, strategic, with a good sense of humour. In war, he was eager, brutal, innovative, and invariably victorious. As a family man, he was soft, patient, and loving. Let's leave the last observation to Richard Cruz, captain of the Marines on board the HMS Dromedary, who met Hongi in the Bay of Islands in 1820, when Hongi came on board to welcome his son back from a stay with Marsden in Sydney. It's Sunday, 27th of February, 1820. There was something particularly respectable in the appearance of Shangi in person. He was a fine-looking man and was dressed in the uniform coat of a British officer. Though one of the most powerful chiefs in the Bay of Islands and its bravest and most enterprising warrior, he was by far the least assuming of those who had been permitted to come on board. And while many of the others tried to force their way into the cabin, he remained with his son on the deck, nor did he attempt to go anywhere without invitation. Wow, what a man. Okay, folks, that's it for now. If anyone knows the location of Mahoi, put something in the comments below. My references are down there as well. For the next episode, we move south. So I hope you'll join me then. But until then, hey Kona, take it easy.